Welcome to the May 1st OpenZFS production user call. We have Andrew, Jan, Stu, Dan, and myself, Michael. And it sounds like Stu has some 18 terabyte multi-actuator drives coming. Stu, do keep us oh. posted once you get those. Uh, do we have any questions for him in advance of what to try? What are you going to do with them? I'm basically doing performance testing to see how it handles large media files in parallel. And for people who may not know what multi-actuator is, tell us. Uh, the, dumb, the lowest version is it's got two read heads, two read write heads on one. So from what I've figured uh, from the documentation is that where you normally have one uh, stack of read write heads uh, on one X. Now you have basically uh, two stacks on the same uh, bearing so that you can basically simultaneously select different cylinders on the upper and lower half of your uh, plotters. So it's definitely not that one means per that per you per can yeah. potentially um, reach higher uh, about double the IOPS and in theory double the sequential read speed as well. And um, the IOPS is probably more realistic to uh, sustain. Hmm. But it splits the available platters in two rather than one per platter. Yes, not one per platter. That, that would, uh, be cool. okay. would be the conclusion. But uh, instead, you now have basically uh, think of it like slicing the disk uh, into two thin, thinner disks and just keeping them in one uh, chassis. So it's basically the upper and the lower half of the uh, stacked uh, platters is just basically now two in a dependent drive from a performance point of view. Uh, but I still, like that. I like that concept of saying two drives in one, but with one motor. I like that idea. That's a good that's, way to visualize it. That's what uh, it looks like. Uh, some of the earlier marketing materials looked like they had a complete second uh, stack of read right hats uh, from the opposite side going in, basically one from the front and one from the back. But it doesn't look like that's how it's physically implemented. It yeah, looks think, like that. Yeah, I think that's the first time I saw them too, Jan. And I think that they figured out that it wasn't mechanically efficient. Yeah, you have more moving parts that would have been probably even more expensive. And the other problem is that then you would have two read white hats uh, operating on the same plotter, and that brings up a whole host of calibration issues because then you have one read right head with <laughs> which has to Close deal with the tolerances on the other one uh, which would probably be a nightmare to get reliable and what's your eta on having those ballpark Um, I'm hoping by the end of the month, end of May. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, do keep us posted because I think a bunch of us have been watching those for years and wondering any day now, are those the future or that's just a whole bunch of extra moving parts? Is, is it marketing fluff or is it reality? Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I'll My cynical it. take it is it's a niche product for certain hyperscalers and their, uh, object storage services. I personally am concerned that like half your hard drive might die, I suppose. And does that mean the other half goes with it just because it goes with it? Or do you then just have half your capacity as a different logical drive for until you really want a new well, one? Well, I would I say know. it depends when you have the head crash on the upper half and mm. the kicked up um, debris hits the lower part or the other way around. Yeah, You're exactly. probably over time going to leave lose both halves so you really 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 shouldn't put them in the same uh, rate basically mm -hmm. well if you wanted to have if you wanted to do like a raid 10 you could put them 
both on the you know both on one disc for the zero, and then yeah, write yeah. it across well, to another off, disc, and that would be because, fine. Yeah, striping them would be fine, but don't treat them as any kind of redundancy between each other, because Absolutely. things like the drive, the bearings, uh, voltage regulators, all of that is single point of failure. Ah, oh, yeah, if you get two logical drives and you have, like, say, RAID Z2, then you might have a magnificent false sense of security. Double failure. Exactly. Ew. That would be... Ew. Ew. Okay. But you up. could... Uh, You're set up to learn you things the hard way. You could put them into two RAID Z2 uh, across basically the upper half of each drive in one RAID Z Z2 and the lower half in another. Because mm -hmm. ZFS stripes over all uh, VDEFs. Mm. So that would be reasonable. So let's say you have uh, eight of them and they show up, up at 16 drives, then you can just uh, basically have a RAID Z2 over the first uh, half and then another one over the second half of each drive. Cool. Keep us posted. Uh, Dan L., you had questions about VMs on ZFS. Yeah. Um, this came up in a Reddit thread the other day. So, so, someone was saying, hey, listen, is there any re reason why I shouldn't use a ZFS on a VM? And I told them that we've been using ZFS on VMware for FreeBSD hosts for a very long time. And the reply came back, well, I've read that you really shouldn't do that because then you get RAID conflicting with ZFS, something like that. And the ZFS should always have direct access to the drives. And the only thing I can think of is that someone has taken the, the, the legend, the myth, the advice, that ZFS should always have direct access to the drives and don't go through a RAID controller unless it's in IT mode, for example. Um, I have heard stories that uh, VMware or whatever virtualization you're using has sort of tried to correct something and then ZFS corrected it and back and forth, you get into a fight. But we've never really seen that and we're running a few hundred VMs on VMware, with, and many of them have ZFS. Okay. And the reason we use ZFS in, in a VM is for the many reasons that you use it in a real host. We like to separate the, we like the tools that come with ZFS, and that's why we use it in a VM, even though we can snapshot the whole VM, et cetera. So, I've never really seen a, a thorough diagnosis as to why you should not use ZFS under uh, virtualization. There is nothing wrong with using ZFS in a virtual machine. Uh, you just have to uh, keep in mind what it can and can't do. For example, ZFS, even a freeware mirror, I can't guarantee you that the free virtual uh, block devices in your VM are in separate failure domains and aren't just files on the same file system. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that? And for, so the hype, let's say you have a virtual machine and you really care about reliability and you aren't fully versed with everything. So you just create, give the virtual machine free uh, virtual disks and create a mirror over all three drives for triple mirroring. And then uh, the single file system containing all the Q code two images uh, right. of your three disks gets corrupted, and all three disks are killed by the yeah. same single uh, yeah. bit uh, uh, error or something like that. So um, there's that. And the other argument against it is that ZFS, while great, does have a certain overhead, and it may be better to uh, put this level of sophistication outside of the virtual machine and manage it from the outset so that the virtual, virtual machine has less overhead, can be smaller, and you have a 
control plane outside of that to handle snapshotting, replication, uh, just uh, check something and so on. So you may want to put ZFS underneath and then do snapshotting on the whole, of the whole virtual machine instead of, of a single file system inside of it. Uh, it's not to, to say that that's invalid to do, it's just that there's a cost with it, that cost can be well worth it. And um, there are arguments to be made to have this yeah. complexity outside of ZFS. And the other problem is that not all of your virtual machines are probably running uh, ZFS. So you have to have a solution for the other guests which aren't running ZFS so that you can manage those mm -hmm. and have external uh, hypervisor provided snapshotting and redundancy. And then why go different work just for the few virtual machines capable of running ZFS? And it, the, for practical reasons, one of the biggest hurdles I think for people getting started with it in a smaller environment is that the minimum viable size of a virtual machine uh, goes up a lot if you have to have enough memory and CPUs and so on to afford ZFS at a reasonable performance and cost. Also, as Michael is putting in the document right now, double buffering becomes a probable issue because you're going to be probably doing some buffering below ZFS at that point that ZFS has no knowledge of. So uh, that's that can be inefficient. That's mostly an issue if you're really doing ZFS on ZFS. And there Well, are... but you're still gonna you're still gonna be having a buffering level occurring no matter what your lower lower file system is. Every file system does some buffering. Sure, but so does every uh, modern ish block device. It all has some kind of all but the cheapest crap yeah. has some kind of DRAM cache. Absolutely, yeah. but the block device isn't using the memory of your machine to do it. It's, 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 about, it's a tuning issue underlying. I mean, it's there, there is a happy medium where everything will work the way you want it to work. Yep. I generally don't have any caching turned on on my VM host if I've got it in the underlying system. Yep. That's also what I would recommend with ZFS. If you're really running uh, ZFS and the whole the hypervisor as well, to configure the uh, uh, Z volts you're passing through to the virtual machines as uh, primary cache equals metadata, so that the host doesn't cache the block device content, but only the metadata to locate this individual block quickly. And then let the guest handle that. Uh, supposedly, there's a problem with. Windows, which kind of in some circumstances disables the most caching when it detects that it's virtualized uh, in some ways, and then uh, trusts the host to do the virtualization of uh, sorry, the cache of the virtualized storage. But um, yeah, measure uh, your setup. <laughs> yeah, and, and, um, get away, and get away from VMware and go Proxmox, and you can <laughs> with all your ZFS tools directly on the underlying system. Yeah. Uh, at work, moving from VMware isn't really an option. <laughs> uh, Bummer. Until you get your there support, are two things support that, contract. For there are two things that you mentioned, John, um, both of which are okay in our situation. We, we back up the host uh, with VMware snapshots or a VMware plugin. Uh, on our ZFS VMs, we are not using snapshots for uh, any kind of backup device. We, we're more along the lines of snapshotting something before we do certain operations and then use a snapshot only if we need to. Um, That's more, totally fine. I can't, can't remember what I said in, in the Reddit reply about what, what we use, ZF, what features of ZFS we used, particularly in VMs, but there are some. Yeah, it's not something that I would say is particularly bad. I would just say be aware of your limits. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. We, we use it on a single disk. All, all of our hosts, which are using ZFS, are not using mirroring or RAID Z2 or anything like that. It's just a simple ZFS drive. Uh, and you have a the, link to that post on finding uh, ancient ones. So sorry to interrupt. Uh, when you're using uh, ZFS on virtual machines, some uh, for uh, let's say 
invasive administrative things like upgrading the guest operating system to the next release. If it's a ZFS system, you don't just have um, ZFS boot environments as an option on most ZFS capable operating systems. You can also uh, use a uh, full wide um, it's a name checkpointing, which is a very heavyweight, basically pool wide snapshot, which then allows you to roll back the whole pool, including things like the pool upgrade, because yep. mm-hmm. which are normally irreversible. Now you can basically roll back the whole uh, pool to before you um, broke it. But the downside is that basically no storage. Uh, Free after the uh, checkpoint uh, is really free, so um, you should only use it until you know that your system is back up and running. But it's really a nice uh, safety layer during an upgrade. Another thing you can also do is not do a ZFS update until you're sure you're happy with the OS update. Yeah. Yes, uh, our, our but. Usual version for that is to upgrade the OS, see that there's a need for the uh, Z-pull upgrade, and then do that. If the host comes up and everything is green, then we'll do the Z-pull upgrade. And, and with that, that's we a good do a view. checkpoint and another reboot. Um, other good practice is to do it before you add uh, VDEFs to a pool because Z pool uh, checkpoint rewinding should also be able to undo adding a rate Z2 uh, or adding a misconfigured D rate or something because you're truly rolling back basically the the whole life allocation of the pool so that you can undo even things you normally can't undo. So if you exactly this uh, later found out that you're not that you didn't add two uh, red Z2s, but six red Z2s of two drives or something crazy like that. <laughs> if you got transposed your metrics of drives and your script or something like that. Uh, Dan, if you have that link, drop it in the chat. And also I posted in the chat and in the doc, the classic canonical IX systems blog post originally from Jaw. Josh Petzl on the subject, because to somewhat state the obvious, almost every free NAS developer back in the day was running ESXi under their desk with uh, with their build on top of it. So he made some good points about uh, mirroring like Jan, you touched on, and uh, a few things, what not to do. But I've certainly helped a lot of people roll back pools that are on virtualized storage and it's not pretty. And sometimes it rolls back consistently years on end, unfortunately, but uh, here's that post, which looks like it's changed over the years, but I don't know if the original is available. Uh, Anyhow. Um, Josh has helped me many times. Awesome. Uh, oh, okay. Try to find the original. I'll look up that Reddit post now. Cool. Anything else related to that? I'm glad we talked about the double buffering. Um, yeah, naturally, uh, I suppose I hadn't realized, yeah, if QCAT 2 under the hood is having major issues and you have three disks on it, you may not get a whole lot of benefits there. And it's impressive that the Reddit comments go back as far as like nine years on the topic. So that's why it was hard to find a link. (laughs) Mr. Bell, while Daniel L looks that up, uh, do you have any topics or questions? Uh, No, not too much. Just wanted to, I have a a talk today at NYC Bug, my very first. So I thought it would be helpful to listen to people casually talk about CFS before I go 
officially talk about CFS. Ah. So. Well, if you have you time, know, you, until then, uh, listen to every recording. Go ahead. Dan. You, you'll have a good time. One of my favorite talks to get benefits for newbies. Oh, yeah? That's great. Well, you're talking about just a general talk or? Yeah, it's it's really about, so Zelf is not really, my, my replication suite isn't really ready for prime time exactly well the, we i mean it's it's plenty used in production but there's but it's really about the principles that i used so sort of a, a unix fundamental way to do it building blocks rather than uh you know than an application or a suite mm -hmm. the, the thing to always keep in mind regardless of who's giving the talk or where you're giving the talk, you're the expert on the topic, not the people you're giving the talk to. So hopefully that gives you confidence. Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Uh, yeah, it's it's more about the slides. <laughs> that, uh, you know, did I practice enough? That sort of thing. Yeah, I, I assume it will be recorded. Actually, I'm really excited, uh, Jan, if you, if you were to watch it and give me any any pointers technical or, or otherwise i would definitely definitely appreciate it i hope it'll be streamed actually i we'll will see. check with patrick uh i think it will be and also i found a link to the original out of web archive so before they made it into still virtualize uh let's see the origin uh, with Mr. Beer Guy, and that will make sense in a few seconds. Uh, I forget what was his beer of choice, but this guy. <laughs> so this was more authentic to Josh Petzl's brain dump on the topic, and I put the link in both the chat and the document. So uh, oh, and for what it's worth, hey, PCI Pastor is your friend. If you can get away with that, great, but not everyone can. Uh, so, yeah, there you have it. Um, Anyway, a uh, show of hands who can make it to BSD can. I'm hoping at least three of us. Jan, we talked about it. Andrew, it's not can. far from me. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, and for those who are not clear, uh, our dear friend Dan Langell invented BSD can. Thank you, Dan. Hi. <laughs> Still, you may not have. Uh, so... Um, Good luck tonight, Dan, uh, Daniel B. And don't give away all your secrets that uh, you will reveal at BSD can because hey, it's a practice run. Yeah, this will no be question. yeah. This will this will be like the the first the first two thirds. It's gonna focus on you know more more concept. Nice, nice. but I'll give oh. a bird's eye view of all the fancy stuff we can do. And in case you missed it, you have hit ports. Is that your first port? It is. It is. It is. Thank oh, can you, you tell us briefly I, uh, about that? Uh, let's, I'll, I'll throw some notes in. Uh, yes. I, it's quite I, cool I what you asked, Yeah, I asked Alan and friends to help me put the port in FreeBSD. And then a couple weeks later, it was in, it was a FreeBSD port. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. It was, it was like, it was like magic. And also now, of course, I hate the release that's there. So I'm I'm oh. doing a <laughs> so I'm doing a so I'm doing a complete sort of refactor to to make the code a little more legible and uh, add some of the you know some of the feature uh, some some of the features you know I sort of developed in my head here. So like a clone rotate, there there aren't you know things that a backup tool that can say oh my god that's been you know that's been rolled back i need to get the you know i need to to make sure that both diverged 
backup sets are are backed up um and some some features like that that i i haven't seen in other well in many other systems i wonder if uh, some of the appliances have them cool but, uh yeah so How do I, you got, handle, I definitely have my work cut out you mentioned doing steps in the right order how do you handle uh things on non uh so let's say i have five different uh, zfs file systems in a tree uh, structure but the at empty uh, snapshot wasn't created as a single recursive snapshot on each uh, file system but basically uh, they came up over time and i created one and then the next so i can't do a recursive rollback for example I have to loop over them and then do a rollback on each individual data set. Right. Um, do you cover that? Do you generate a ZFS channel program for that? Or uh, do you just uh, fail in one or either atomicity or uh, doing it correctly like all the other tools? <laughs> Well, because I'm not sure. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I understand what. What uh, about your What about your example would would make the would make it not would make it not predictable? Um, so um, the case I ran into is I had uh, a complicated jail configuration which created the data sets uh, at, at, in multiple steps uh, because it's include this snippet here, include this snippet there. Basically, I, each individual file system gets created, and then I take an at empty snapshot. And I found out that if you do that, you can't do a, a ZFS rollback dash R common parent data set at empty, because it's not considered the same uh, snapshot, it has the same name, but it's not a recursive snapshot. It's a right, okay. way to so, tell it apart like that. And well, I'm so only... I found out that I really have to list, list all the file systems and then try to roll back each to the empty snapshot. Well, um, I mean, I'm only going to give it... So if, if, there's no, if there's no matching delta between the between the two replicas then i rotate the whole thing and i would only you know and i would only use a clone origin for the for the ones that do have a match but but you're not losing you're not losing any data either you know you're not you're still you're definitely not going to lose data on the on the backup side and then anything else even if the names are all wrong it doesn't matter or or if they're they don't even have to be snapshots on the source it could be bookmarks as long as there's a GI, GUID match, then I can then I can replicate from from whatever origin it is. So um, yeah, I don't I don't think that I mean I would love to I, I would love you to to you know to create a script that can generate that that example and I can and I can make sure that I can cover it. But I think I I think I can. I think my dash dash rotate would would you know, do it, do it well enough. It would, it would rename the target and then, and then clone whatever it can and, you know, or, or just replicate over what it can. So, I mean, it is, it's definitely designed to be bug magnet proof. So it, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see, but I think, I think I have that covered. Oh, and, and I, I buried the lead. I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I definitely added bookmark support. So you don't actually need snapshots in the source at all anymore. That should be really helpful for someone putting it in a while true loop to uh, get an asynchronous best effort replication. Yeah, for sure. And it's, yeah, and also, yeah, anybody that's like close to their 80% capacity, you need to, people need to bookmark and nuke every last snapshot they have. So yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely, an, it's definitely a nice feature to have. Also, I was thinking a useful metadata thing to do with bookmarks is to, um, is to sort of leave a bookmark on the way out. So when I've, when I've taken a, you know, when I've created a su successful replication, 
I create a bookmark with the with the name of the replicating host. Uh, this backup host was here. So if you have two or three backup hosts working on a machine, you can leave a little uh, leave a little uh, breadcrumb. That, so the source uh, knows so, all stays. So the source knows. Yeah, nice. so that would be a way to do that in, directly in metadata rather than worry about pickle files on a on a backup system, which you know, which is definitely what my one of my goals is to to make it so that it doesn't matter how terribly maintained your ZFS infrastructure is, I'm still going to replicate it. <laughs> I'm still I'm still going to get it. I'm still going to get it out of there. The other use case for them would be to. Uh, not have to start replicating a failed transfer from scratch again, but to have a bookmark every gigabyte or so, similar to what ZWebber does. To yeah. Lose less right. progress because let's see, you want to replicate a terabyte of data through a home internet connection. And then every now, every time you try it, you get killed by the 24 hour reconnect. And, and well, why is that IP address, and then your uh, replication connection is uh, killed. And of course, you can put some kind of VPN or reliable reconnecting tunnel in between. But just being able to lose no more than a gigabyte would also solve the problem for most users. Um, so why why does that matter versus just the the regular um, recovery token? That also, the important part is that you have some kind to basically to resume between snapshots, so that you don't have to start again from a snapshot. Because potentially, if you have a pool which doesn't have uh, snapshots over time, it could be that the first snapshot between, let's say, even if you have an add empty, but the step between add empty and at last date based one could be hundreds of gigabytes, if not dozens of terabytes or worse on a file system. And then uh, replicating that uh, in I, a way I just so that you I can just only don't go from why, why, doesn't the, why doesn't the resume token cover that? You know, the though, resume because... token can also do that if you use it. That's also a newish feature. Hmm. It used to be that... Uh, you couldn't do that, and it was really annoying when you had I to. I believe do quite a few tools don't use say, it, right? Yep, and if you uh, had to, let's say, do the initial offsite backup of an existing pool or add an offsite site or something like this, and you had any network issues in between. For example, I once uh, did it wrong and created a pool with. Yeah, I did. instead of having like a weight Z3 over, uh, f uh, I think, uh, 15 drives each, I had uh, a weight Z3 with three drives per weight Z, uh, but 15 uh, weight Z3s. And then, uh, great, I did an initial fill on that stupid uh, pool layout. And then I had to wipe it and fill it from the uh, over the <laughs> initial uh, network connection. And that took like, um, one and a half months to the initial upload of mm -hmm. just 100% link utilization. Uh, the ISP we went to the fiber firm asked if everything was okay because you've been at 99% link utilization for a month now. And you could just say, yeah, and then like another two weeks, it should be done because it was just the 100 megabit line. It technically, it was a gigabit, but it was if you then barely the unit we pay for was 100 megabits, so it was shaped to that. And since it was just adding a second offsite backup in addition to the on site backup, it wasn't a huge issue, it was just annoying. Cool, Daniel. Did you say you hit uh Debian also? No, no, I didn't. Oh, I thought you mentioned I, another I mean... platform. Okay, my bad. Oh, um, yeah, I, I think I think uh, I'm getting some help with the uh, with the porting of those, but I think I might want to just finish the 
at least that 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 rotate function because I think it's just it's just so useful and I'd like to get that nice. in the into the oh. next release which will which will also be the the BSD cam release. So yeah. could you describe the rotate, Jan? As you mentioned, is that the same thing no, as the no, the rotate is successful be or different? Daniel's uh, thing to describe because he did okay. it. Yeah, Daniel. How right. You so it's rotate? just. I'm sorry. So basically, the, basically the operation is um, you rename a, a target replica, and then you um, and th this would this would be necessary and under two conditions. One, if the target replica has changed. So let's say you boot a VM on on two sides on both replicas, and you kind of need to keep something in both of them, or you do a rollback on the source. So in those cases, I, I there's a I'll do what, what I call a rotate, which is just rename the target, and then replicate from the from the source again, except use the common snapshot from the from the uh, from the origin that I just renamed. So you just copy. So basically, okay. so basically, it's a clone and copy, and it's recursive. Now this is a pain to, yeah. to write the the command the command to do that, especially recursively. Is an absolute bear because you can't treat a clone like a um, like a snapshot exactly. You have to do a dash o origin for each oh. one, and you can only do it with the dash lowercase i command. It doesn't work with capital I for some reason, which I haven't figured oh, out yet. Interesting. I don't um, know if that's a shortcoming or bug. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I think a Maybe good bug. use case for that. Let's say you're doing what I've been working towards with jails, and you destroy it jail and then recreate it yeah. from the uh, uh, jail.conf so you do a test something you change your jail.conf to install the packages and so on and then you destroy the data set and create a new data set of the same name and in between there's a backup and if you're not doing what uh, daniel um finally figured out how to do with dfs what happens is that either you get a replication error because you now you have data sets on the source with the same name, but they are technically not related to the uh, yep. data, which is already backed up. Or you have to do a destroy dash uh, uppercase RF or something uh, yeah, on no, the that, uh, backup uh, target, which is really scary. And you kind of, um, when you're writing your tooling or testing tooling and you find something like uh, CFS destroy dash uppercase R on the backup program. Mm. No, it's you're doing route yeah, work. That's awesome. Ah. You really don't want to put dash uppercase RF uh, some uh, so basically recursive for all dependents and force uh, mm. somewhere in your backup switch because yeah, that can have major implications and undo all the persistence you fought you had against fat fingers. I believe Daniel's uh, mantra was if you need force, you're you've failed already. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to phrase it, but yeah. Just I mean mistakes do it, mistakes it, happen, but rename on conflict is a good idea. There's like eleven there's like eleven different ways to not delete your backups. So sure. I don't know why the the standard model is is risk recursively deleting half your backups. Like it's, it's just, it just makes more sense not to do that. Because it's quite tedious to figure out how to uh, untangle the tree structure and merge back in what you can keep. Because potentially some of the subtrees are, have been renamed out of the way and moved back in. So. You may have matches for subtrees, but not for one of the parents. You can do that. Hmm. So As... before you destroy, let's say you have a jail and you want to destroy it, instead of just ZFS destroy dash I in the whole jail, you could say, oh, my slash Vardy B I want to keep. Uh, I rename that out of the way, destroy the jail, create a fresh jail, and rename the Vardy V back into place. So now you have a parent uh, file system, for example, for your jail, which is unrelated to the one which previously had the 
uh, name, but you have now a child under that which is related and could just replicate. So it gets really gnarly because you can do that recursively if you are insane enough to, uh, or you are unlucky enough to end up with such a pool. Yeah. As far as clones not going through uh, with capital I and specifically requiring the lowercase i, um, my belief is that is not a bug. That is by design. Good point. Um, okay, Sit and do tell. I know. I well, I I just know my my scripts, which have been floating around for, I mean, not floating around, but we, but I've been using for ten years now. I'll use lower, the lowercase i syntax. So, yeah. So that's uh, the bat. The only, I mean, I guess, I guess it does. It sort of makes sense why that's necessary because it is a sort of it's a different operation than a typical i or lowercase or capital i operation just the downside is a bummer because it it means that um i now have to track not just the matching snapshot or the matching you know the matching bookmark whatever the matching point and also the following one if i want to make sure mm -hmm. to get every single one after that clone otherwise i can make a mistake and skip some okay. um so it actually changed the way that I I had to to uh, report from the 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 piece of code that does the matching the the Z match as uh, so because because I have to do the the I have to look for the next one the, the 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 yeah the next one and then the next between the next one and the and the full data set to make sure they get from a clone every single snapshot and don't miss any. Um, you know, which is which is fine. I mean, that's what scripts are for, I guess. But uh, yeah, bummer that you can't do capital I. Cool. And the little birdie tells me your talk will be recorded and probably streamed. Go ahead and watch for at BSD TV on various social media platforms for a link to the live stream. And any any mistake you point out tonight will not be in BSD can, so they're very Perfect. very welcome. <laughs> yeah, those hey um, dry runs are great. Yeah. On that note, I better get out of here. Cool. Thanks, well, everybody. have a great talk. Hey, thank you, and thanks for Zelta. It is awesome. It is it's the the clean break and fresh start we needed. Ah, uh, thanks. You're welcome. I'll talk to you soon. Take it. Good luck. Okay, well, uh, I, I am so delighted with uh, his work. Now that he's left, I'll talk behind his back. I even had this like 40 page Google Doc on what I slightly kind of think better replication would look like. And he gleaned some ideas. I'm so, so happy he did that. Not, I'm just delighted. Anywho, anything else, gang? Or shall we call it good? My apologies for being a little backlogged on recordings. I've had a lot going on. Stuff happens. I would say we all. Yeah, that's true. And I didn't even make it to NAB or to Linux Fest Northwest, which is like technically right around the corner. Although Bellingham is always like another hour or two further than I remember. <laughs> Wait, I'm I'm like almost in Canada. What the heck? Anyway. Uh, I'm happy to update this, but I'm also happy to call it. Excuse me. 1949. Anyway. Right. And, and Mike, when you see yeah. that that stream for the conference, can you throw it in one of the ZFS Slack channels or something? Oh, I will try. That's actually a really good point because it is absolutely on brand there. You are correct. So it's be... That way I don't have to go look, look any, any further. <laughs> yeah, them. no kidding. So you're on the, the main developer Slack? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I hope I got this time right. It's been a while since I lived in Europe. Okay, gang. Thank you. Thank you all. It was good topics. And if you're unsure about anyone, time yes. zones, yes. please just put in UTC and don't do the conversion because having to do the conversion yourself, it's not a big annoyance. Mm -hmm. Trusting an incorrect uh, conversion can be a real pain in the ass. I use Google for right or wrong. So there's you, that. 
UTC is the only time that matters. Yeah, ah. put it in. Yeah, twenty forty nine Zulu and everything's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I yeah. prefer GMT to UTC. Yeah, it's all it's close enough. <laughs> potato, potato. There you go. Thanks, gang. Like and subscribe. There you guys.